Let's go ahead and kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we're grateful today for your amazing grace. How sweet that sounds. We're grateful today for your love to us that you've shown us in so many ways this past week. We pray for the Holy Spirit to strengthen and guide us in all that's said and done here this morning. To your name's honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'd like to start this morning. This, of course, is our ongoing series that we're doing called Ellen and the End. And a few weeks back, when I gave my last talk on Ellen and the End, I inserted this slide about various Adventist organizations that received millions of dollars in federal paycheck protection loans despite religious liberty concerns. This, of course, was taken from Spectrum Magazine, Spectrum Magazine, July 14 of 2020, so just about a month ago. And right after we gave the talk, and I don't know if there was a correlation or connection, which doesn't make any difference, but one of the ministries among many that received federal loans from the government, one that was mentioned in this article was Amazing Facts. Uh, along with 3ABN, Weimar Institute, and other organizations. Shortly after the talk, within the last couple of weeks, Doug Batchelor made a video in which he said that, 3A, or, that Amazing Facts did not receive the monies from the federal government. So I wanted to make that correction. I think that's important. Uh, Doug Batchelor said that they didn't receive the funds and uh, that they had thought about it, but in the end decided not to. So I feel that that's important that we make that clear. Okay? All right. No more to be said about that. We'll start this morning. These are all statements as we go forward in our study this morning that Ellen White has made concerning the end of time. Now, if anybody has a comment, a question, feel free to share that this morning. Review and Herald, March 18, 1884. Fascinating statement from Ellen White. She says this, the Lord has a controversy with his professed people in these last days. Now, I'd like to ask, as we start right off, who are God's professed people in these last days? Who are they? It's us, Jasmine, that's exactly right. It's us. I was out in Loma Linda several years ago, and uh, I quoted this statement, and a man came up afterwards and challenged me and said, oh no, those are the apostate Protestant or evangelical churches. Well, that's just not true. Ellen White never in her writings referred to the professed people of God as the apostate Protestants or the Roman Catholic churches. This is clearly referencing the Seventh-day Adventist people in these last days. The quote goes on, in this controversy that the Lord has with his people, men in responsible positions 
will take a course directly opposite to that pursued by Nehemiah. Well, that sentence only further clarifies the fact that the professed people of God that Ellen White is talking about are Seventh-day Adventists. Now, who are men in responsible positions? Who, who would that be referencing? Leaders. leaders, okay. Talking about leadership, we're looking at conference officials, we're looking at pastors. So men in very important positions. And Ellen White says they will take a course directly opposite to that pursued by Nehemiah. Now, what did Nehemiah do? What did Nehemiah do? What was the key thing that he did in his work? What was it? Okay, he, did, he didn't rebuild the temple, but he rebuilt the wall that surrounded Jerusalem. He rebuilt the wall. Paul? Yes, he did that. But Nehemiah also reinstituted and reinforced the Sabbath and brought it back up to where he separated the Sabbath from the apostate leaders. That's what he did. So mm -hmm. the wall rebuilt the commandments, and then Nehemiah strictly enforced biblical Sabbath observance. Okay. He separated the people. Okay. Let's notice that particular point. Um, Nehemiah rebuilt the wall. Now, now let's go, let's go here. What does the wall represent? What was the wall of protection? Cody, what was that? That the wall of protection is symbolically the law of God. Okay. The hedge of protection. Okay. So it's interesting, Nehemiah, you have a, a, a spiritual application and a literal application, both pointing to the Sabbath in some way. He's building the wall or reinstituting God's law, which would include the Sabbath. You can take that spiritually today as for us, but then you also see in his literal life, as Paul pointed out, he actually enforced the, the Sabbath himself. So it points to it twice in two different ways. It's really very interesting. So when Mrs. White, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that our leaders in Seventh-day Adventism will take a course directly opposite to Nehemiah, it will be an attack against the law of God, and it will be an attack against the Sabbath. Absolutely, Cody. Great point. Great point. Let's notice, definitely, the wall is the law of God. That was the protection for God's children. All right, Jasmine, go ahead. What is the wall for us today? What's that? What is the wall for us today? Okay, great question. What is the wall of protection around us today as God's children? What is that wall that he has placed around us to keep us safe from the devil's attacks. What is it? It's Paul? God's law and upholding God's law, period. That was clear in Job. Okay. But the thing is, we already see this happening with the current corona thing. They have closed the churches. We already see this working against, do you think Nehemiah would have closed, stopped the Sabbath? We already see this, so there, and you know, it's not just conference, it's independence too. There's mm -hmm. a big shaking and sifting going on here. But the wall is the same as Isaiah 58. Absolutely. It's mercy. It's the individual person going out, not just going to church on Saturday, because you can do that on Sunday too, but going out and being like Jesus was. Spending your own money, spending your time, Helping, not just spreading the gospel, but helping. Read Isaiah 58. There's your wall. 
Do and we, we are to be repairers of the breach. And then the Sabbath is the crowning glory. And it's amazing that Seventh-day Adventists don't understand that. But we already see this happening now, contrary to Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Paul. And men in responsible positions taking a course directly opposite as Nehemiah exalted the law, exalted the Sabbath, so are we today. So are we today. But God's men in responsible positions are doing the exact opposite of what Nehemiah did. Now notice in Nehemiah chapter 13. Notice in Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah... 13 verse 15, the Bible says, In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, bringing in sheaves, lading asses, as also wine grapes and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein which brought fish and all manner of ware and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And verse 19, And it came to pass when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So, Nehemiah physically builds the wall surrounding Jerusalem. He exalts the seventh-day Sabbath. And today, that wall of protection around us is the law of God, and especially the seventh-day Sabbath. And Ellen White, now see, folk, if we were to say, well, this is talking about apostate Protestants, as one man said to me a few year, years ago. Well, then this doesn't make any sense because Nehemiah exalted the law. If this is apostate Protestants, they never have exalted God's law. So this it doesn't make any sense. This clearly is referencing Seventh-day Adventists, and it's saying that Adventist leaders will do exactly the opposite of Nehemiah. Instead of exalting the law of God and the Seventh-day Sabbath, they will tear it down. Paul, go ahead. An another situation, remember as the wall finished, they didn't have the gates done. And there was a reason for that, that God allowed that to happen. Everybody was coming in and out, whoever pleased. They could come, and it was hard to control. And finally, they had to get the gates done. But we also see uh, control given to the leadership to control what goes on on the Sabbath according to the law of God. It's a very spiritual uh, application. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we don't see the law as spiritual anymore. Everybody sees it as physical. For instance, the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. They don't apply that to apostasy in the church. They apply that to some physical thing going on between a couple of people. But the gate controlled because the gate was not installed. It took some time to get the doors made. And now where was the problem? The leadership is to control according to the commandments what goes on in the church. And the wine and the, and the bread they're bringing in is all false. It's all apostate. That needs to be kept out. They don't peddle it on the Sabbath. And it's up to the leadership to see that this apostasy keeps out of the sanctuary on the Sabbath. But the people run to it. They want it. So those gates represent the gatekeeper, which was Nehemiah. He was the leader. He controlled what went on on the Sabbath within those gates, just as you have to and anybody who stands up as a leader must do 
and will be held responsible for that. Absolutely, Paul. Absolutely. Great point, Paul. Appreciate it. Let's go on. It says they will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, but they will try to keep it from others by burying it beneath the rubbish of custom and tradition. In churches, now let's clarify here what, what we're looking at. What churches, what's the context of this quote, what churches are we talking about? Brother Jess, what was that? Sabbath keeping, Seventh-day Adventist churches. That's what this quote is talking about. In Seventh-day Adventist churches and in large gatherings in the open air. Now, what do we call large gatherings in the open air? What's another name for that? Camp meeting, camp meeting Jim. That's right, a camp meeting. So Ellen White talking about the denigration of the Sabbath by Adventist leaders, she says, in Seventh-day Adventist churches and at camp meetings, ministers, now what kind of ministers is she talking about? Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh Adventist pastors, yes, that's right. Seventh-day Adventist pastors, as she goes on, will urge upon the people the necessity of keeping the first day of the week. Seventh-day Adventist ministers will urge. Now, when you urge somebody to do something, what are you doing? Brother Jess, you're, you're, a, you're a father. If you urge your children to do something your, the way that you know is right, what are you doing? Okay, you're guiding them in a particular direction. Okay, Sister Jasmine, you're compelling. You're compelling somebody to go in a certain way. You know, Cody, go ahead. When, when we urge somebody, it, it's not encouraging. It's not patting them on the back and saying, I think you ought to do this. <laughs> the word urge, it's, it's you're compelling, you're pushing. You're pushing somebody to do something your, the way you want to do it. Now, folk... Ellen White right here is saying in Seventh-day Adventist churches, Adventist ministers will urge Seventh-day Adventists to keep the necessity. Now, is that, when you use the word, when she used the word necessity, is that saying you have an option? Is that saying you can choose what you want to do? No, it's not the only way it's the only way urging necessity it's a necessity there's no alternative here Adventist ministers will tell Seventh-day Adventists they must keep Sunday now what kind of a climate what kind of a climate does this statement right here picture in our minds what kind of a climate is going on in society at large that Adventist ministers would urge Seventh-day Adventists to keep Sunday? What kind of a climate are we looking at here? 
Paul? The stage is set now. You have to close your churches to be safe. We urge you to do this. You have to wear masks. We urge you to do this. Don't have fellowship. We urge you to. This is setting the stage. These are baby steps working up to, well, you're going to lose everything you own. You're going to lose your job. Seventh-day Adventists shouldn't own anything here anyway. We shouldn't be buying and selling property now. We should be getting our house in order. Because I think, as I said to you this morning, remember, all ten versions are asleep. We have no idea how serious this situation is. We think we do, but you could wake up one morning and you can have this urge now. Absolutely, Paul. Absolutely. So Seventh-day Adventist ministers in Seventh-day Adventist churches and at camp meetings who have for years and decades told and worshipped people on the Sabbath, now they will say, no, 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 no. We've got to do what we're told. We, if the government's saying this is what has to be. And so Adventist ministers will capitulate and tell Seventh-day Adventists, you've got to accept the mark of the beast. You know, I've often heard Seventh-day Adventists say, you know, the church is going through, and, um, you know, even though there's apostasy in the church, don't worry. The church will rectify itself, it will be cleansed, and it will go through to the end. This statement is not saying that. This statement is saying that the apostasy in Adventism today is going headlong towards embracing the mark of the beast. And folk, is that going on into the kingdom? Is that going into the New Jerusalem? No, it's not. Those that go through, and this is where we need clarity, friends. The apostasy in Adventism goes through to the lake of fire. Those that remain faithful, those that cling to Christ, those who continue to proclaim his truth, they are the church that goes through to the New Jerusalem. You see what, what's going on here? Apostasy, folk, never goes through to heaven. It's not going through, friends. But God's faithful that remain true they go through to the New Jerusalem. Did somebody have a hand? Cody, go ahead. I was going to say, it, it reminds me of Noah and his family. Ham was, as far as I know, unrepentant his entire life. And we won't see him in heaven. He made it through that calamity. But as you said, he won't be in heaven unless he some, somewhere repented of that's not recorded. I don't know. But it's interesting here, the weapon of choice that they use to destroy the Sabbath is custom and tradition. How many false narratives of history do we have going on in our climate today? I mean, Amen. as Paul said, I think the stage is set now. We have a very authoritarian, top-down leadership that we're seeing going on in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, even in the independence as well. We're seeing this top-down authority sort of conditioning of the people and this already urging of different things that they need to do. How easy is it for them to take that next step, Amen. capitulate with the government, which they've already have by accepting money during this time of COVID-19, mm -hmm. and capitulate further to use history like the pilgrims, oh, they kept Sunday and this and that. There, there is history there, but it's a false narrative. It's a false interpretation of history. And we're, how much false history do we have going on right now? I mean, we're, we have that going on in spades right now with these protests that are going on, is this false narrative of history. It's destroying 
the Constitution, and it's destroying the Christian principles upon which this country was founded, and that's what it was designed to do. Amen. Appreciate the comment, Cody. Paul, go ahead. What, one more. It's interesting, too, with <laughs> Nehemiah, that he was a very strong, resolute leader. He would not be sidetracked, and you know what? The people sensed that, and they followed him. They did what he told them to do. He was strong. He would not swerve in the least from his mission. You know, and yeah, I mean, he told families, you have to break up. These heathens have to take their children and leave, period. And if not, we're going to do something about it. If you don't get from in front of the gates of this city, I will come down there and lay hands on you on the Sabbath. What do you think that meant? Hmm. But no, James White used to physically remove people out of meetings that were disruptive. Physically take them and throw them out the front. Well, no, we enter them in. We bring them in. We welcome. Oh, that's not love. Really? Getting <laughs> cast in the lake of fire is not love either. Okay, so again, what mercy and justice has to be mingled here. However, we cannot compromise. Amen. And the stage is set for a Sunday law. Amen. You know, I want to go back, Paul. Great, great points. And I want to tell you guys something. This is what I love about Sabbath school. This is about sharing. It's about giving and taking. It's analyzing truth and sharing it together. And that's what I love. That's why I wanted to teach Sabbath school classes because I want involvement among the brethren. So this is awesome. Notice in Nehemiah chapter 13, uh, verse seven through nine, it says, and I came to Jerusalem and understood the e uh, understood of the evil that Eliashib, now Eliashib was the high priest. He was the ultimate religious authority among God's people. He would be the general conference president, okay? And so it says, the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah. Now, Tobiah was an enemy. If you read the book of Nehemiah, Tobiah was an enemy of God's people. There was Sanballat, Tobiah and Gresham. These three men, we would look at them as Roman priests. We would look at them as apostate Protestants, however you want to decipher it. But they were the determined enemy of God's people. Going on. Eliashib prepared for Tobiah a chamber in the courts of the house of God. So the Seventh-day Adventist high priest brought a Roman Catholic priest and set him up right in the temple quarters. That's what he did. And everybody was fine with that. But going on, verse 8, and it grieved me sore. Nehemiah was furious. He said, how dare you mix the truth of God with this apostate? How dare you do that? Therefore, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. I commanded, they cleansed the chambers. Thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. How did Nehemiah deal with apostasy? <laughs> what did he do? Jasmine, Cody, get, let's get the mic over here. Just a second. What did Nehemiah do with Tobiah? He Jesse? got physically involved and got rid of his things out of the, the area where uh, Eliah, um, Eliashib had set him up. Nehemiah okay. was jealous for God, just like Elijah. Okay, okay. Amen. Nehemiah took his stuff and threw it out. Threw it out. Nehemiah was single to doing the work of God. That's what he was. 
And that's what we need to be. Amen. Cody? You just reminded me of another event in Nehemiah's life and a great principle. Maybe you could help me exactly where it's located, but I believe it was Sam Ballot that wanted to meet with Nehemiah, mm -hmm. right? And he wanted to, he was gonna, it was a trap. What he was going to do was he was going to basically kidnap him. I'm not sure exactly the logistics of it. They were going to kill him. And what Nehemiah did is he said, I don't have time to be distracted by your side stuff. I have a work to do. I'm going to continue to do the work before me. You know, I'm obviously paraphrasing him. But he's going to continue to do the work before him. And he wasn't able to be sidetracked by that stuff. How great of a principle is that for us today with all the distractions Cody <laughs> this this is the one time when tunnel vision is okay Nehemiah had tunnel vision he had one goal he had one purpose and nobody was going to deter him from that let's read the passage from what you just described and then Paul will get you Nehemiah chapter 6 notice Verses 1 to 3, it says, Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall, that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Nehemiah said, I don't have time. I don't have time to come and meet with you people so that you can try to do me in. I've got work to do. Paul, go ahead. Something else. These men were Samaritans. This Absolutely. needs to be pointed out because they were Israelites initially. So you had a two factions of Seventh-day Adventists that war here over the Sabbath. We see that today. Also, I say to people who come and get involved in a the work, they'll stay there for a little while. Oh, well, I need to go here. I got to run up to Tennessee. I got to run out here. I got to go out there and do that. There's your principle from Nehemiah. If the Lord sent you to a place to get a work done, I don't care how bad the environment is, you need to stay there and get it done. What, he can't protect us? Jesus grew up in Nazareth. You think Nehemiah wouldn't have liked to have left? It would have been calmer back in the courts of, of his king in, in Medio Persia than it was there. And Mrs. White says the Holy Spirit told him, do not go with these men. They're gonna kill you. So there's a lot of principle. These were Samaritans. These were Seventh-day Adventists. So pay attention to that. I think that's quite important. Yeah, this good points, Paul. This is a, a powerful story, powerful story, and one that we need to emulate. Going on, it says, there are calamities on sea and land. These calamities will increase one disaster following close upon another, and the little band of conscientious Sabbath keepers will be pointed out as the ones who are bringing the wrath of God upon the world by their disregard of Sunday. Now, what did she just do there? What did Ellen White just do? She's been talking about the Seventh-day Adventist denomination right here. Adventist, Adventist leaders, directly opposite of Nehemiah. Adventist ministers urging Seventh-day Adventists to accept the mark of the beast. So she's talked about 
apostate Adventism right here. And then she counts in, brings in another group. Did you notice that? Right here. The little band of conscientious Sabbath keepers. These aren't conscientious Sabbath keepers. These are apostate Seventh-day Adventists. And she says, but there's another little group, a little band, she calls them, of conscientious Sabbath keepers will be pointed out as the ones who are bringing the wrath of God upon the world. So, folk, clearly from 1884, what is that, 136 years ago, in the mind of Ellen White, she clearly saw at the end of time there would be two groups of Seventh-day Adventists. She saw it, friends. Apostate Adventism, apostate denomination, but there would be a faithful little band. A faithful little band. The question we've got to ask ourselves is, in which group are we? In which group are we today? Powerful, powerful quote. Review and Herald, March 18, 1884. Now, this is a statement from Prophets and Kings, pages 186 to 188. It says, in the closing work of God in the earth, well, I think she's talking about today, the standard of his law will be again exalted. False religion may prevail. Iniquity may abound. The love of many may wax cold. The cross of Calvary may be lost sight of. And darkness like the pall of death may spread over the world. The whole force of the popular current may be turned against the truth. Plot after plot may be formed to overthrow the people of God. And some people will tell us today, well, Ellen White was good for her day, for devotional thought. Friend, I think she's describing us right now, isn't she? She is describing the world and the church right now, today. She goes on, but in the hour of greatest peril, the God of Elijah will raise up human instrumentalities to bear a message that will not be silenced. Praise God, friends. Praise God. It's going to look like, as it does today, that the work of God is going nowhere. But the God of Elijah, he has an arsenal. He has 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And they will bear a message that will not be silenced. Praise the Lord. In the populous cities of the land, in the places where men have gone to the greatest lengths in speaking against the Most High, the voice of stern rebuke will be heard. I love these statements. The message will not be silenced. The voice of stern rebuke will be heard. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Paul, go ahead. You know, you know, Bill, for a couple of decades, I've heard you talk about prophecy, Revelation 14, Daniel. Now we're living it. These are events that are happening right now. And the amazing thing is, this, we have been conditioned as a people from when I was a little kid to be afraid of this time. 
Oh, we can't bring on persecution. I remember in the early 90s, oh, you can't spread the three angels' messages because you're Catholic bashing. Remember that term, Catholic Absolutely. bashing? Jan Markison's book was, an, uh, was just an abomination to Adventists. Absolutely. You got Kenneth Cox went out there and said, no, we don't believe that on national television. Mm -hmm. Now we're living this. And people are being forced to make, Seventh-day Adventists, to make decisions. Amen, Paul. And to be mighty as an army with banners. Are we going to cower or are we going to be like the apostles, disciples were when they became apostles, to rather joy when they were beaten, to be treated like their master was. No, we're, we're wearing little masks as a mark of Rome's influence on our society. We're closing our churches. We are not gonna be these people unless we wanna be, and we can go out and be victorious. Everything else will fade. Our homes, our possessions will all fade in light of this work, just like Nehemiah did. Amen, Paul. Amen. Oh, I just love this quote. <laughs> God will always have a people. The voice of stern rebuke, it will be heard in this world. Boldly. Boldly will men of God's appointment denounce the union of the church with the world. Earnestly will they call upon men and women to turn from the observance of a man-made institution to the observance of the true Sabbath. And who's going to give that message, friend? Think about it for a minute. In light of the last statement we just read, is the denomination going to give that message? No, they're not. This is the little band of Sabbath keepers. Boldly will they denounce the union of the church with the world. Earnestly will they call upon men and women to turn from the observance of a man-made institution to the observance of the true Sabbath. Fear God and give glory to Him, they will proclaim to every nation, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of His indignation." Now, the Sabbath school time this morning was not on this particular subject, but I want you to notice a contrast here because I had a text message this week from some dear friends of mine, and they said, we know we have a relative who we greatly love, and he is asking about where in the Bible do you find a Sunday law? So where, where in the Bible do we find a Sunday law? Well, you, clearly right here, clearly, the world is called upon to honor the commandment of him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Worship, in Matthew 15, verse 9, Jesus said, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So true worship is honoring God's commands through the power of Christ. And false worship is the honoring of a man-made tradition. So here in Revelation 14, we're called upon to honor the commandment that reveals God as our creator. And in contrast to that, in Revelation 14, verse 9, the world is warned against honoring a tradition of the papacy and apostate Protestants. And that tradition is directly opposite of the commandment to honor the Creator. 
So what tradition has the papacy and apostate Protestants exalted that is directly contrary to the Sabbath? What is it? Clearly it's Sunday. Clearly it's Sunday. And of course in Revelation chapter 13, the second beast, the United States, tells the world they are to honor the tradition of Rome. That's Revelation 13, verse 12 and 13. So folk, just in a brief nutshell, is the Sunday law right there in the Bible? Of course it is. Of course it is. Cody, go ahead. You know what's very interesting about this is the idea of fear and how it controls people. People will keep the mark of the beast because they're fearful of losing their possessions. They're fearful of the wrath of the state, of the wrath of the devil. And in turn, they shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Our God is a terrible God to those who are disobedient. The Apostle Paul says, fear not him that can destroy the body, but fear him that can destroy the body and soul by casting thee into hell. And Mrs. White says that when people realize the mistake that they have made, they will run in the streets and cry up to God and cry mercy but there will be none. It's ironic, isn't it, that the catalyst of why they decided to accept the mark of the beast was to avoid their, was to, because of fear. And in the end, what do they get in the end? They get a triple, quadruple, hundredfold dose of fear when they realize that not only is their lives lost, their properties lost, everything, careers, whatever, but their souls eternally will be separated from God and they will cease to exist and they will receive the full measure of their punishment. Absolutely. Correct. From the God who balances the accounts one day, the, all these accounts, all these injustices, they will be balanced. Absolutely, Cody. Great, great point, Cody, that there's two fears. There's either, we either fear and reverence God, or we fear and reverence the beast in his image. And if we choose the beast in his image to fear them and do what they say, well, we not only destroy ourselves here, but then we have to meet the wrath of God. Great point. Great point. Going on, today is in the days of Elijah, the line of demarcation between God's commandment-keeping people and the worshipers of false gods is clearly drawn. How long halt ye between two opinions? The Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. The message for today is Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people that she be not partakers of her sins, that she receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Revelation 18, 2, 4, and 5. The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The observance of the false Sabbath, well, there's that word again, isn't there? urged upon us, pushed, you got to do this. The contest will be between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. Those who have yielded step by step to worldly demands and conform to worldly customs will then yield to the powers that be. So it's a process. It's a process. We yield 
and we keep yielding and we keep yielding till we do whatever government tells us, even to the sacrifice of our conscience. will then yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. At that time, the gold will be separated from the dross. Again, folk, we have two groups. Two groups. We have apostasy. We have the true children of God. Two groups. True godliness will be clearly distinguished from the appearance and tinsel of it. Many a star that we have admired for its brilliance will then go out in darkness. Those who have assumed the ornaments of the sanctuary but are not clothed with Christ's righteousness will then appear in the shame of their own nakedness. And right here, folk, is where the rubber hits the road. Right here. Are we in submission to the authority of Jesus Christ on a daily basis? Are we allowing him to empower us to walk in his law? And therein is the bottom line. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful today for the incredible gift of the spirit of prophecy. And we are eternally grateful today for the opportunity again to receive, to accept the righteousness of Christ, which involves forgiveness for past sin and involves power to overcome today. We are grateful for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We just pray, Lord, that you would empower us to be those men and women of boldness, those men and women who will speak forth the truth, though the heavens fall. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.